It's time for another edition of Simple Science with Darren. Darren went on Instagram and asked what you guys would be interested in learning about. And I, as I gather, an overwhelming response of people wanted to hear about how alcohol affects uh, the body. So with that said, Darren, tell us why is drinking not so good? Yeah, you know what's funny is that um, <laughs> the poll was between volcanoes, you know, <laughs> learning about why they erupt, you know, is climate change a part of that or alcohol? And yes, you're right, many people wanted to know about alcohol. <laughs> um, un unsurprisingly, uh, and another thing that I researched actually was do different alcohols give you worse hangovers, which I'm really interested to talk to you about. Oh, I didn't think that there was any science behind it, but there actually is. Um, and is there a scientifically proven way to cure your hangover? Oh. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna go into the science behind how it affects your brain. Uh, so to understand that, you have to know about two neurotransmitter. GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. Now, what makes them excitatory versus inhibitory? To know that, you kind of have to understand a little bit about neurons. So neurons at rest generally have um, a voltage of negative 70 millivolts. And for them to fire, they have to reach a threshold of negative 55 millivolts. Now, how do they reach that threshold? This is where um, the neurotransmitters and the receptors come in. So with GABA, I actually have a picture here of the two neurotransmitters. So here, here's the neurotransmitters. So um, the green one, you can see that one's GABA. Uh, the green little triangles are binding to the receptor. And normally when GABA binds to its receptor, it's gonna let in a lot of negative ions. And so when there's a lot more negative ions, that makes the neuron even more negative. So it's, it's gonna make it a lot less likely um, that it's going to be able to fire and it's gonna take a way bigger stimulus for it to be able to fire. So that's, so GABA is inhibitory. Yes, so GABA is inhibitory. it needs far more, it's like basically bogged down. Yes, exactly. So GABA feels good when it's enhanced, enhanced and increased. Um, not necessarily, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, so not, get it. not necessarily. Oh, okay. um, so if, if we go to that picture one more time, um, so you can see, so <laughs> ethanol, that's the little yellow ball. Yeah. Um, so you can see that it's, binded to the right side of that receptor. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And so when alcohol and GABA are binded to that, it keeps the channel open. Normally it would, it would close after a little bit to oh, not let okay. more negative ions in. But when alcohol is binded to it, it actually lets in a lot more negative ions. Um, so those, those neurons that are in, inhibited are gonna be even more inhibited, which is why you see such a huge um, central nervous system depressant uh, in, in alcohol. Oh, so that's how your, when your body just becomes really like, Heavy, basically. Exactly. Like exactly. Down. So, okay. yeah. So you're not really receiving all that uh, sensory information, and you're not really able to process it at a fast rate. Um, and then again, if we go back to that one picture, so the NMDA receptor, that is the receptor of glutamate, which is an excitatory neurotransmitter. And how GABA, or sorry, how alcohol affects that is it actually blocks that receptor so that positive ions can't flow in there anymore. So it actually inhibits the excitatory neurotransmitters. And what this does uh, to your body and your brain, now we can go back to that brain picture, um, is it affects all these different parts of your brain. So as you can see, the frontal cor cortex, which is the judgment portion, this is probably <laughs> why there's way too many videos of frat boys trying to belly flop on a beer pong table. <laughs> um, the motor cortex, the sensory cortex, and the visual cortex, all those are, um, all those work together to try to coordinate movements and speech, which is why you see um, you know, slurred speech and kind of hard to walk sometimes, you get a little bit tired. And one thing that I was really interested in researching is why I have to pee so much yeah. when I'm drinking. Yep. Um, and this is actually really interesting. So the hypothalamus in the brain um, creates a hormone called the antidiuretic hormone. Um, and what this does is it stores it in the pituitary gland. And um, from there it is, secreted and it binds to receptors on the kidney to tell your kidney to reabsorb water so that your blood pressure stays regulated and so that you have enough water in your body. Alcohol actually messes with that signal so that um, antidiuretic hormone is not released. And so your kidney is chilling there not knowing um, you know, to reabsorb the water, so it sends it to your bladder to be, to be released. Okay, so wait, this wait. is why you have to pee so much is because you don't have antidiuretic hormone secreted uh, in your body. Okay, so, so, the, so the hormone basically is also, just like everything else, it's all just sort of drunk, I guess for, for lack of, everything in your body just becomes drunk and heavy. Yeah, and slowed down. Slowed down, not as responsive. And so that even happens to just to just your, hor your hormones communicating to your bladder. Mm -hmm. Exactly. About, yo, we have to, wait. 
Explain it again, Darren. Okay, so naturally, <laughs> yeah, okay, so naturally the antidiuretic hormone is released from the pituitary gland to tell your kidneys to reabsorb water to keep your blood pressure regulated and to keep enough water in your body. Right. But uh, when you are drunk, when you have alcohol, it it uh, completely inhibits that, so it stops the release of antidiuretic hormone. So your kidneys have no idea um, you know, to reabsorb the water or how much water to absorb. So it just like, okay, I guess I'll send this to the bladder now to be released since, oh. since the body isn't telling me that it needs it. So basically it's like, oh, we don't like, I guess we don't need any of this. So we should just get rid yeah, of we it. Should Let's go, get, get, get it came in, yeah. get it out. Yeah, which is pretty ironic because, um, you know, one of the symptoms of, you know, a hangover is you're really, really dehydrated. It's because your body didn't know they needed all that water, which is why you should definitely <laughs> drink water when you're yes. drinking. Yeah, I'm glad sure. you brought that up. That's that's always been my kind of cure for hangover. It's just to make sure that I'm drinking water while I'm drinking. Yeah, that's yeah. what you always, so you hear, and maybe Darren, you can correct us, you hear that the way to cure a hangover or to prevent a hangover uh, is drinking water and sometimes taking ibuprofen for the headache before you go to sleep. It, is, is any of that true with regards to cure a hangover? Is that dangerous though to take ibuprofen on like a stomach full of alcohol? Um. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. By the time that you are, you know, hung over the next day, um, most of the alcohol is is out of your system, and because you're not drinking more, it's generally okay to take the ibuprofen. But the main thing, there actually is no scientifically proven cure for a hangover. Unfortunately, I'm sorry. But because you are so dehydrated, you need to rehydrate. You need to drink a ton of water if you aren't feeling nauseated. Maybe get some Gatorade. Um, one thing that I read that is supposed to help with nausea is actually ginger, which I've heard if you are seasick um, and, and you eat a little ginger, that actually helps. So I'm interested to know um, if you guys have, have any hangover cures that you've tried. I've heard greasy food, which apparently um, lines your intestines and you know it's, stops it's, the reabsorption of alcohol. It feels good sometimes. Other times, like I'll just feel completely sick even smelling food. That's how bad that hangover is. It, but yeah. honestly, it's it's about hydrating yourself, I think. Hydrating, and also, if you have a placebo that works, like if it is greasy food, you're like, oh, my hangover cure is a burrito, then go for it. You um, know, another thing that, sorry to cut you off, another thing that I love to do if you like do a lot of heavy drinking one night, try to before you go to bed take a shower. It's the best thing ever, unless like you're gonna slip and like. Crack also, your skull. it helps not to wake up feeling smelly. Um, before we go to break, I do want to hear from Darren on the different types of yeah. alcohol and how they affect your body. So, can you briefly explain that for us? Right, this is super interesting. Um, so, during the fermentation process, yeast is combined with some form of sugar, um, depending on the alcohol and um, sugar in the presence of fermenting yeast actually turns into ethanol, which is alcohol, um, and CO2. But another byproduct of that is actually something called congeners. And these are substances that um, that include chemicals such as um, acetaldehyde. And acetaldehyde Ooh. is actually 30 times more toxic than, than um, alcohol itself. Uh, so these actually are what scientists think are responsible for your hangovers. And an interesting fact is that darker um, alcohols, such as like rum, brandy, whiskey. tequila, whiskey, all those have a higher percentage of um, congeners, specifically acetaldehyde, uh, which is why, I, you know, I, I always heard, you know, the darker the alcohol, the worse the hangover. I had no idea why, but there's actually a scientific backing to it, and it's because of these congeners, which help to give it the taste and smell, uh, but they also make it a little bit more toxic for you if you're into the darker um, liquors. So you guys heard it here first from Darren with a scientific backing, vodka only.